for joining our online talk, Biodiversity and Birds at the Dead Zoo. My name is Geraldine and I work in the Education Department at the National Museum of Ireland Natural History. We very much hope you're having a really enjoyable National Biodiversity Week and that you're getting out and about uh, into the, to see the nature in the wild. Uh, but today's broadcast is a closed YouTube live event with a pre-recorded talk that will last about just over 20 minutes. We will then be back here live for a Q&A and the entire event will be posted online at a later stage so that you can watch it uh, again or use it as a reference or please do share it with any friends or family that might enjoy it. If you would like to ask any questions, please do, and please use the chat feature that is on YouTube. And please be aware that to post a question, you will need to have a YouTube account. And we will try and get through as many questions as we can in the 10 minutes we have, okay? So, today's talk is by the museum's recently appointed keeper uh, of the Dead Zoo, Paolo Viscardi. Paolo, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Jay. How are you keeping? Very good. Thanks Very good. a million for joining us um, on such a beautiful day as well. And I suppose I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk, and I'm sure our audience is, are too. So let's just get straight into it. So everyone, please enjoy the talk, and we'll see you back here afterwards for a live Q&A with Paolo um, and myself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paolo Viscardi, and I'm the Keeper of Natural History at the National Museum of Ireland. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about what can dead birds tell us. Um, and I'll be focusing on biodiversity uh, because biodiversity is biodiversity week right now, and biodiversity is a really important topic. Um, and mostly I'm going to be talking about the birds here in the Dead Zoo. So just to get things started, um, I'm going to explain what biodiversity is, because you hear the word a lot, but it's not always very clear what people mean by it. So in this case, it basically just means nature. Um, it's the variety of all living things and the way in which they interact. And that can be in multiple different levels. It could be a genetic level, it could be a population level, it could be all sorts of ways, but it's just the, the whole of that big interaction between every living thing. Now, birds are quite an important part of biodiversity and certainly good indicators of biodiversity um, because they can fly and that allows them to move between different environments. So they can create connections between habitats and ecosystems. So something like um, a seabird, you might get something like a puffin uh, or a gull or something like that. Um, they can go into a marine environment. They will feed on things like fish and so forth. Um, and then they can come back to a terrestrial environment, a land environment, uh, where they will, you know, they will do their business. They will feed their young. They'll do all sorts of things. And they're bringing some of the nutrients from one environment into another. Um, and similarly, they, they often migrate as well. Birds, um, not all birds, but many, many bird species migrate. So something like a goose, for example, will migrate sometimes up to the Arctic for the summer to where they nest and they, they rear their offspring in a nice, relatively um, safe environment, uh, feeding on the, the grass and the vegetation that grows there during the summer months, a very long summer months. And then they will fly to somewhere like Ireland to spread in the winter. And by doing that, they're bringing nutrients and part of that environment in the Arctic back to Ireland with them, and vice versa. When they go back in the summer, they're taking part of Ireland back to the Arctic. Those connections are quite important, and um, it goes kind of beyond that as well. You, you have these really, really useful um, kind of indicators in the, in the form of birds because they are so visible. They, they, they migrate, they fly around, you see them during the day because most of them fly during the day. Um, so they give you a really good clue about what's going on in terms of the environment around you because they have certain requirements. So for example, if a bird feeds mostly on insects, there's a pretty good chance that you've got a lot of insects around if you see those birds. If you see something like a swallow or a swift flying high, you know that there are insects up there that, it's, that they're feeding on. And that tells you something about the environment and biodiversity in that area. Well, if you don't have any birds like that and you'd expect them there, then you know there might be an issue. So there are lots of ways in which birds can be quite um, a useful indicator of, of biodiversity. And um, I'll kind of go into a little bit more detail about how that relates to the collections here in the Dead Zoo. And so you might know us from um, kind of our displays where we have a lot of things like the giant Irish deer, which are really you know, iconic and characteristic. And, you know, but, we, but we don't just have big stuff. Um, you know, we've got around I don't know, 
And at the moment, we've probably got about 3,000 objects on display in the Irish room because um, our upper floors are closed while we're doing some uh, redevelopment work. Um, but in the rest of the collections behind the scenes, we have millions of specimens, and they're really important as a resource for research um, and for understanding biodiversity. Part of that kind of understanding of biodiversity isn't just about the kind of the hard research bit. Some of it's about the kind of personal research. So if you want to know what a bird looks like in order to be able to identify if you see it, um, it's useful to have a reference. And so our taxidermy collections that are on display are actually originally put in as a way of referring to the birds that you find in Ireland. Um, you can go through this, for example, as our ducks case, and it has lots of different species of, of ducks and geese and it's got swans. These are a big family, which people can often find it quite hard to tell apart because you know a lot of the birds within the big family um, tend to look quite similar. By having all of the birds next to each other, you can see the sizes, you can see the different colors, you can see the different patterns. It makes it much easier to start to pick apart which ones are which and figure out ways of identifying them. So that if you're, say, walking by a pond and you see a whole bunch of different sorts of ducks and geese, you might be able to start telling them apart a bit more easily. Now, obviously, in the 19th century, this is much more important than it is today, because today, you know, most of us have a mobile phone that can tell us which bird is which, because we can have a look for a photo, or, um, you know, these days, you've even got AI things where you can point a phone at a species and it can get an identification. Um, the world has, has changed a lot. But back in the 19th century, when the museum was, was built and opened, um, you couldn't do that. And so it's really important to have this, this resource there to help us understand the biodiversity in Ireland and in the wider world. And that's something which has never really kind of gone away. We still need that resource because um, those collections tell us something about the past, which we, we can never go and find out again without a time machine. So for us, um, the dead birds in our collections can tell us an awful lot, mainly because they have a load of information with them. So we don't just have a dead bird, we have a dead bird which has an identification that it will have a location of where it came from, where it was collected. Um, we will know who collected it, we will know when it was collected. And all of that information tells us more and more and more. And when you look at it as a whole, so you know we have around 20,000 um, you know, birds in the collection like this, that allows us to get a much better understanding of birds and their distribution through history and in different places and different parts of the world. A really important piece of research um, that was carried out back in the 19th century, the late 19th century, um, and it was published in, in 1900, was uh, on the migration of birds. A really, really significant piece of work uh, by Richard Barrington. And he basically um, coordinated a big citizen science project where light station keepers all around the coast of Ireland, and so those are people who were manning the lighthouses and light ships, which help prevent um, kind of other ships from crashing into rocks, and they would find a lot of birds would die because they would fly into the lights, especially at night when they're migrating. And this killed striking is, is actually quite an important um, kind of feature because it means that birds were regularly being supplied without having to kind of go out looking for them. They, they were just hitting the light stations. And because they're fixed points, it actually provided a really, really good way of measuring which species of birds were turning up in particular places at particular times of the year. And light station keepers are very good at keeping records. Um, when you're dealing with shipping, you have to keep track of all sorts of information from the weather through to where ships are heading and all the rest of it. Um, all of that kind of um, skill set of, of taking down information became a really important part of reporting the, where these birds were coming from and how they were being collected. So um, they were actually just being sent in the post um, to Barrington, who was compiling all of this information. And... Uh, because it's hard to send a whole bird in the post, especially if it's large, um, he just asked for a, a wing and a leg, which is actually all you really need to identify most species of birds. Um, and so the light station keepers would take a wing and a leg from all the dead birds that were kind of lying around at the foot of the light, light station um, and send it in the post with the information that they had gathered from uh, when it was collected. So really, really important, um, you know, we have, over 3,000 of these sorts of specimens, really, really valuable um, information that they contain about the distribution of birds in Ireland and the way in which their migration changes over time. 
um, and it kind of captures a snapshot from the late 19th uh, the late 19th century which we can compare against today so we can understand by doing that comparison whether bird migration has changed and migration patterns can change for a variety of reasons um, it can change because uh, you have other environments opening up which offer the same sort of habitats that birds that are migrating can pass over and they don't have to continue their migration if they see something that will be suitable for their needs directly underneath them. Why would they? Um, but more importantly, it also helps to give you an idea of the changing seasons because birds migrate on a seasonal basis. And as seasons get longer or shorter, um, it has an impact on the time of their migration because the resources that they need in their destination will either not be there or will be there earlier um, at different times of year as the seasons get, get altered. And obviously climate change is a big um, reason why seasons have changed. So in the case of the Barrington collection, it gives us this really great snapshot from literally all around the coast of Ireland. This is a map of all the light stations and they've got little red dots there you might just be able to see. All of those have contributed specimens and data um, to help inform that big process of understanding the migration of birds into and out of Ireland. Um, and not just that, we also have kind of a really good idea of the different species. Um, and that has opened up um, kind of an understanding of the birds that can visit Ireland that you might not expect. So there were 18 new species to Ireland found by the light station keepers who sent specimens through to Barrington. Um, and some of these, and in, like this slate colored junco um, here pictured, um, are from North America. And this is something which um, has, has kind of happened for a while. It's, it's a very long way between Ireland and America. And yet birds will make that journey. Now, sometimes they might hitch a ride on a ship, um, but sometimes uh, there will actually be just, just really severe weather conditions and they will end up coming over caught up in really, really strong winds. So this is a specimen, not from that lighthouse collection, but this is a recent specimen from a couple of years ago in 2018. Um, and this uh, is a least bitten, which is a type of uh, really small um, relative of the herons, which lives in America, it's, um, usually from kind of the, um, uh, the eastern coast of America. And this one managed to get blown really significantly off course in one of the big Atlantic storms that happened in uh, 2018 and ended up on the island of Ireland. And this is actually the first record for this species um, in Europe. So this is something really new and um, relatively unprecedented. We, we, this, this, you know, having vagrant birds, having these birds which get blown off course and end up in a place isn't that unusual. But the types of birds that it happens to um, can be quite indicative of bigger changes in the, the world around us. And that's a really important thing to know. And that whole kind of concept of change and the importance of specimens in understanding it um, kind of goes beyond just uh, the occasional bird blowing in from, the, from America in, in high winds. Um, can also tell us about the endemic species in a particular place. Um, so in this case, these are some birds which are collected by a guy called March, who was based in Jamaica. And um, Ireland is, you know, it, it used to be part of the British Empire. And as a result, it was a colonized nation and it was part of the, um, the process of colonization as well. So people would be based in other British colonies around the world and they would bring things back or send things back to Ireland. And in this case, um, we have quite a lot of specimens which were collected in Jamaica, and they're actually really important for people who are based in Jamaica still in understanding the species present both historically and currently. And so this information is really important because um, it allows us to know whether or not a species is, is disappeared. Uh, and in this case, it's about the least tern, uh, which you've got pictured on the left hand side there, that small bird. Um, and the question that came to us from uh, research in in, in Jamaica was, uh, is this actually a yellow-billed tern, which is what it was originally described as, or a least tern, which is quite a common species which is still found in Jamaica. And the reason I wanted to know is because the yellow-billed tern doesn't occur in Jamaica today. And um, if it used to occur when it was originally collected, as this specimen was originally described, then it would suggest that that species has been lost from Jamaica. But um, having the collection means we were able to go back and check 
we were able to say, well, actually, it is a leased turn. It was misidentified in the first place. And that allowed us to feed back to people working on biodiversity of Jamaica um, so that they had a better understanding of the biodiversity of the island. Um, and by doing that, it meant that um, the, the researchers in Jamaica were able to say, well, this species was probably never present here, rather than saying this species is now extinct here. And that's actually quite a big difference. Because um, if it was never there, then that's fine. That's not a problem. But if it's become extinct, then th that's a problem. You know, that has resulted it, because of changes in the environment, because of changes in land use, all sorts of things can, affect, uh, can create the conditions for extinction. But it's a really important thing to understand, especially if you want to kind of prevent future extinctions. So... That's not something which is just uh, limited to kind of exotic places. Extinction is something that happens everywhere. Um, even in Ireland, this bird on the left, that's a corn bunting. That went extinct in Ireland in kind of the 1980s. Um, used to be quite a common bird. Now it doesn't occur in Ireland at all. It's a local extinction and it's obviously quite an important thing to understand. Uh, and the reasons for that extinction are based around land use and changing land use, changing farming practices. And those things we, we have to really kind of get to grips with because they impact on biodiversity in a really significant way. Um, other things that we will find is that bird species um, start appearing more frequently. So the greater spotted woodpecker, which is the bird on the right, um, that you, you used to get the occasional visitor, but now actually there's a breeding population of greater spotted woodpeckers and they're getting quite well established. So it goes to show that um, you can get change in an environment and it's not necessarily just loss, it can be gain as well. Um, but it's really interesting and, and important that we understand the reasons for those changes because they obviously impact on how we manage our land and, and what, what's going on if we want to preserve other species and prevent their, them from going extinct. Um, speaking of extinction, um, obviously uh, we, we have specimens from all over the world and some of those are now the only examples that we have of birds which are extinct. Um, so the collections are quite an important thing about informing us about past biodiversity. So things like the dodo um, and the Rodriguez solitaire, which are the birds on the left hand side there. Um, obviously, you know, they're, they're from small tropical islands and they tell us a story about how um, things like rats and pigs and goats and so on getting introduced to um, kind of small islands has led to the result, has led to the extinction of, of some species of birds. Quite important. Um, the birds, the bones on the right there, and um, those are from the Great Orc. And these are from um, a little island just off the coast of Ireland. And um, these are from the Midden, so people were eating these. And what that tells us is a different story. It tells us how um, the, the kind of use of uh, biological resources of biodiversity um, can sometimes impact on it in a really negative way. So in the case of the Great Orc, it was hunted to extinction and it was a very fatty bird and, and a great source of oil and easy source of food because they couldn't fly. And so they were exploited quite heavily. These are the sorts of stories which is really important for us to understand, partly um, just so we know more about the world around us, but partly so we can prevent things like that from happening again. And that's something which we all have to take, you know, real, uh, we have to take seriously. You know, we have a certain um, duty of care to the environment. And, you know, our, our impact on the environment is huge. Um, so dead birds um, in our collections can tell us a lot about environmental change, actually. Um, so in this case, um, this is a researcher who was doing some really cool research on our collections and other collections around, uh, around the UK and um, in America, looking at uh, birds with white plumage and taking a look at the reflectance uh, of that plumage based on um, soot, basically. So it was a way for this guy Shane, um, Shane Dubay, uh, to understand how the air pollution in different parts of the world and different parts of each country um, varied over time. Uh, it's a really, really cool piece of research and it was looking really at, at smoke from fires and, and noticing that um, a lot of the time in urban environments, the air um, kind of cleanliness improved quite significantly after the 1960s, after there started to be Clean Air Act and so on. Um, whereas in rural environments, that actually didn't really um, improve significantly and still hasn't in many places. There's still an awful lot of uh, this, this soot in the air because people still use open fires. These are the sorts of things which 
again, help us to understand um, how changes in the way in which we function as a society and the decisions that are made and the rules that are made uh, impact on the wider environment. Um, something else that dead birds can tell us about, um, and especially in terms of the impact that we have on the world around us, um, comes in from us telling the stories of kind of modern issues that are you know, still happening and, and are a result of human interference in the world. Um, you know, we cannot do anything but interfere with the world with the way in which we live. Uh, we, we consume an awful lot and we waste an awful lot. And all of that has an impact. And so whether it's plastic pollution, whether it's climate change, whether it's oil skip bills, there's all sorts of different things that can impact on the bird populations um, around us. And they, they have a genuine impact on the world. Um, these are, you know, I, I, I kind of mentioned earlier that birds um, kind of link ecosystems. And that's actually quite an important thing. If we, if we lose those links between e ecosystems, we lose some of that nutrient cycling. We lose some of those things that we depend on for our actual survival. It's a really important thing to keep in mind that this is all one big interlinked um, network of, of kind of life. We are part of that network. We are part of biodiversity. And it's really important for us to understand our role and our impact to try to make sure that you know we're not just it's not just about looking after the rest of the planet, it's about looking after ourselves as well as part of that whole process. Um, so this exhibition that we currently have on display in the Dead Zoo is, uh, is called A Drop in the Ocean. And um, it has birds which have been collected from around the coast of Ireland, and they've all died of natural causes. Um, sometimes, uh, in the case of this, um, this bird here that you see on the left, um, that's a fulma. And you see a little petri dish uh, in front of it, and that, that contains bits of plastic which were found in its gut. These are the sorts of things which um, we need to understand. We need to see how our effect on the planet is impacting on other species um, so that we can do things to try to prevent it. And this exhibition is a really good example of uh, researchers in places like uh, ATU, the, the uh, Atlantic Technological University, um, who are collaborating with artists and taxidermists to do really interesting ways of communicating about our wider world. So if you get an opportunity, um, take a look at the website and uh, you can get a little bit more information from there. So thanks very much for listening to my talk uh, about biodiversity and birds and the dead zoo. Um, and now I'm, I'm happy to take your questions if you have any. Hello and welcome back, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, Paolo. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? You're very welcome. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Sorry. Fantastic. No worries. Sorry about that. And I just wanted to, to mention that we have a really good turnout today. So thank you so much for everyone for tuning in because I know it is a beautiful day outside. Um, so we hope you enjoyed uh, Pello's talk. It was fascinating. And I hope you have some questions for us as well. Um, but I just wanted to mention before we get into our live Q&A that we have um, the story of Barrington um, and how, uh, you know, his important contribution to migration in Ireland and how we got, you know, uh, how Barrington, I suppose, got his specimens, um, the citizen science citizen science project that he initiated. And um, we have a really nice connection in, in the museum of one of our colleagues, actually, um, as you know, Paolo. So like uh, Siobhan Pierce, who's our education officer from the... Um, it, uh, for the dead zoo and um, she actually her granddad was um a, a light ship keeper and he was based on a light ship um off of arklow and in 1911 um, you know, well, he was one of the light keepers that would have uh, re taken all those re recordings, and he he did happen to send some of the um, some birds into Barrington Barrington himself. So they are in our collection, which is just a really cool connection, I suppose. You know. It's, I think it's one of the great things about the collection is that there, there are so many of these sorts of stories about people, um, Irish people, going out and, and actually you know, collecting things and then being in the collection still. So people can come and see them. You know, they can see the things which were donated by their grandparents. And also, so, you know, I, I think it's one of the nice things about having a, a national collection that really is uh, has been built by the people. Um, you know, of, of the country. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource to have. And obviously we've got stuff from other places as well, but it's, it really helps to enrich that link between our collections and the people who, who are still here, um, you know, even if it's through a few generations. Uh, 
Yes, I know. No, it's lovely. I know recently uh, Fintan O'Toole from the um, Irish, the journalist for the Irish Times, he wrote a lovely piece about, again, the biodiversity loss of birds, particularly in Ireland. And, th and he had mentioned in, uh, in his article that his, his grandfather, I think it was, or possibly father actually, um, had donated a, a swift to the collections as well. And it was the first record of, I think it was an, was it an alpine swift? I think it was a pallet swift. Pallet, pallet swift, which was just a, a lovely a piece to read about. And like that, you know, he really enjoyed visiting the museum again uh, to, to see that specimen that's on display. So it is really cool. It's great that we have this collection that was, um, that people contributed to. So we do have some questions coming in now, which is fantastic. So one, the first one I want to ask is from Matthew Paolo, and his question is, um, what are the main challenges that Irish birds face today? And do you have any suggestions on how we can maybe help them? Yeah, I mean, there, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of challenges. It depends on the type of bird and all the rest of it. But, but generally speaking, habitat loss is always um, a major uh, problem for, I think, pr pretty much all species today, um, you know, human impact it changes habitats in the way in which they can be used so that's had a huge effect and that's why things like the corn bunting um, kind of went extinct in ireland because changing habitat use and, and kind of farm um, farming practices and land use and um, those sorts of things have a big impact but also you know um, as the exhibition that we currently have on display from atu and the guys there and um, who did fantastic beautiful taxidermy really really um, good way of engaging with some of these topics yeah. things like pollution uh, plastics you know there's there are so many issues with things like plastics in the oceans um, you know, and other, other forms of pollution. There's, there's plenty of types of pollution out there and you know, our, our modern life just contributes more of it. So, And obviously climate change is, is a yeah. huge issue because that will impact on habitats. It will impact on you know, a whole bunch of things, food webs, all sorts of stuff. So um, those things have, have kind of massive ongoing kind of well, issues for all sorts of wildlife, um, but birds in particular. And of course, you know, if you want to help with that, then you can you can be as environmentally sustainable in your you know, your day to day life as you can be. That's always a, a good thing to be. Um, but also, you can do things like join uh, uh, Bird Watch Ireland. Then you can go and have a look at their website. Um, that you know, they do some really really cool things. They've got lots of information there. So um, th you know, th there are plenty of places you can go and find out more. Um, so you know. It's a case of figuring out what you're able to do and, and you know your level of engagement and that's something which you know that there are ways to do that through through birdwatch for example brilliant yeah i completely agree with you there paolo and i suppose like our um the, ex the temporary exhibition we have now um a drop in the ocean we have a link to the website for that um just in our youtube chat there so please do check it out and some great information on that website and again like just reading more about these birds and then sharing that knowledge with your friends and families like that you don't you know that 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 really does go um, a long way as well. Um, there's somebody here, they don't say their name, um, but they have said, thank you very much for your time, Paolo. It was indeed fascinating, so well done. And um, we have another question here from Janine Bailey, and uh, they say, due to climate, etc., we have gained some new species. Um, does this impact neg negatively on our local species? Are there more challenges down to food or nesting sites? That's a really good question yeah. and point. It's a really good question, and it's it's a difficult one because um, so species change all the time, and especially with birds because they are very mobile. Um, it's it's very hard to say what is you know new, what what has been around for a while, and you know where you've had interchange for a long period of time because obviously you don't necessarily just have a population that just is static and stays in one place. Um, and this idea about um, kind of local species, uh, what makes it local? Is it how long it's been there? Because mm. obviously, since the last glaciation, you know, the end of the last glaciation, there wasn't really much in Ireland at all. So everything came from somewhere else, pretty much. There are a few um, species which seem to have managed to cling on in some refugia um, and, and have kind of um, persisted. But generally, most species have come from somewhere else. So it's actually a really interesting question. Um, and obviously, you know, as soon as you have new species coming in, you, you will have um, maybe some competition for nesting sites in the case of birds, uh, competition for resources. But often, um, because you're having a changing environment, it's more about animals which are coming in being able to use that changed environment better than the animals that were there before. So, for example, corn buntings, go, go, go back to them, um, you know, the environment changed for them, which is what kind of led to their loss in Ireland. Um, but with things like the woodpeckers, you know, the environment is changing, which has led to their gain here. 
those changes in the environment aren't in conflict necessarily. Um, they, they can be just happening at the same time. And as you're having a changing landscape, the species which use that landscape will change. Then, of course, sometimes you will get invasive species. So last week was uh, Invasive Species Week. Um, and they, they do cause genuine problems, not just for um, kind of other wildlife and you know uh, things like I mean, going outside of the birds and um, things like zebra mussels and um, you know, invasive crayfish species. And there are lots of different species which um, are seen as invasive and have a real negative impact on other species within the, uh, within the country for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's carrying diseases, sometimes it's competition for resources, mm. whatever it may be. But there is that direct um, kind of, uh, competition or um, kind of challenge for the same environment and, and that that is obviously an issue but i think generally for birds that's less of an issue I and mean, it will occasionally cause some issues i know that in london the things like the parakeets and uh, which you got everywhere in, in a good example yeah everywhere and you know it's it's kind of cool to see them but at the same time they are competing for things like nesting holes and i've seen them um, fighting with like woodpeckers over holes the woodpecker just made and you know the, the parrots going in the parakeets nesting holes as well so you know, you do have a bit of uh, kind of a friction there as well. Yes, yeah, and our colleagues over in the National Biodiversity Data Centre would be a really good resource if you want to learn more about invasive species. I know they have um, uh, newly launched, I think this year, uh, a, a website dedicated to invasive species. And I think they do mention a couple of bir different bird species on there, ones to watch that are actually impacting on um, not just potentially Ireland, but uh, across uh, Europe. Um, but um, yeah, and I just, I just wanted to, I was just wondering about um, our temporary exhibition, A Drop in the Ocean. Um, like I love the, my favorite um, specimen from that um, is the gannet, because I love watching gannets when I go, you know, walking along the seashore. Um, I love watching them dive and I just and I just I, I think that might be my favorite one in our exhibition our temporary exhibition and I just love how it really draws you in because it's on this what you first think is like oh what's this beautiful colorful nest that they are that it's on and then you know you, you suddenly kind of it dawns on you oh it's plastic it's just all our rubbish and waste and this bird has made this this nest and how unnatural that is and un, unhealthy for it and its chicks so I was just wondering Paolo do you have a favorite from the temporary exhibition and if so, why? I always say that I don't have any favourites. Um, but all my children. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I think um, for me, I, I think the puffin has uh, a particular impact um, because nearly all of the specimens that we have in the museum, um, you know, although everything is dead, um, it is also it looks alive. You know, that is um, part of the, the kind of art and craft of, of taxidermy. It is to make something which has died or is, is dead um, and make it look like a living example of its species and you know bring back the beauty of a living thing back to lot you know, back into into re, like reality with that specimen yeah. it's, it's a real skill i mean it's a what good taxidermy is a fantastic thing yeah um, it's a really respectful thing when it's done right um and you know i think uh, donal and the taxidermist who worked on the um Drop in the Ocean exhibition did a fantastic job with, with that. And, and I know that he struggled somewhat with that uh, puffin specimen because mm. instead of using his skill to make it look like it was alive and it's this beautiful specimen, mm. um, he had to try to make it look dead. And it's very, very hard yeah. um, when your skill is about bringing a dead thing back to life. Um, but not doing that and actually showing it in its dead form. And, and for me, I think that has a lot of impact. And the actual specimen itself just is is beautiful. It's still beautiful. Um, but then, you know, I'm, I'm a curator at a museum full of dead stuff. But I, I, I think there is a certain beauty in, in a dead specimen. Yeah, and I suppose we're so used to seeing them as well. But I have to say, when you see that little puffin and they're so small and it just looks, it's, it is really upsetting. I know some of our visitors do find that upsetting, you know, um, but um, but it's like it's, like it says in the exhibition text, it's important to talk about these things because it is such a, their biodiversity loss is such an issue right now um, around the world and in Ireland. But Paolo, thank you so much. We're just running out of time now, but thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, and uh, we just want to say uh, from both of us that, Thank you everybody who joined today um, and we hope that you enjoyed it and we hope you're enjoying Biodiversity Week. I have, as usual, one small favour to ask you all, which is please take two minutes to fill out an online feedback form that is being sent to you now via Eventbrite. We would really appreciate that. 
And I also, just before we go, I would like to mention that we have some upcoming talks um, as part of our online program for adults. Um, uh, for the rest of the year. So our next one will be during Heritage Week and it will be about our geology uh, collections uh, and it will be given by our geology creator, uh, Dr. Patrick Roycroft. And then as part of the Dublin Festival of History, um, in October, we will have our zoology curator, Dr. Amy Geraghty. Uh, she'll be covering Ir Irish marine expeditions in our collection in her online talk. And then finally, towards the end of the year, we will have our entomology cur curator, Dr. Aidan O'Hanlon, and he will be giving an online talk on some recent discoveries in our collections that are linked to Alfred Russell Wallace, famed for his discovering a uh, co-discovery of um, the theory of evolution through natural selection alongside uh, Charles Darwin. So, some, so lots of things to look forward to. So we hope that you guys will tune in for that too. Uh, so please do check out our website, museum.ie. Uh, keep an eye for upcoming events and subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to be notified about future videos. So that is all for now. Big thanks to everyone involved um, for today's event. You really made it great and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Emil. Thanks, everyone. Bye.